follow me. Praise the Lord. The word that is more important to me this morning in this teaching is that last word. Follow me. Praise the Lord Jesus. I said praise the Lord Jesus. I had a vision some few days ago. And the Lord began to grant me an understanding of that vision and will have to speak along that line. Praise the Lord. The bride of Christ and the image of Christ. Hallelujah. There is only one purpose. There is only one thing. That the Lord intends the purpose of the New Testament, the purpose of creating man was so that man can be in God's image and in, in his likeness. Praise the Lord. Because the purpose for man is for man to have dominion on the face of the earth. Praise the Lord. God's intention for man is that man that God creates should have what? Dominion on the face of the earth. Now, what that means simply is that God wants to have a regent, a representative, an ambassador on earth. Not just any kind of representative, but a representative that would do exactly as God would have done on earth. Now, do we understand that? Now, what that means is that as God's representative on earth, God wants us to be so interwoven and intertwined with his person, with his nature, with his life, with his power, with his authority, to the extent that nothing is lacking when it comes to representing God. Hallelujah. And in expressing of this God, when men make contact with you, they will not be able to touch your person. They will not be able to touch your personality. They will be able to touch only one person. And that person is God because your content of you had been emptied. And the new content is God. Praise the Lord. Now that's God's intention. And we have read here before in the book of Galatians, uh, uh, Romans chapter 8 and verse number... 29 to 30. Now, media, I don't know this television is not working. Hallelujah. Romans chapter 8 and verse number 29 to number 30. 
For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. To be what? To be conformed to the image of his son. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. So you see that the journey from predestination or for knowing is to end in glorification. Hallelujah. Carrying the fullness of the image of Christ. Christ is the image of God and the church is the image of Christ. Are you seeing that? So when Christ came as the pattern man, what we would call the prototype, God's pattern man, God's definition of man, what God intended for man to be and to look like, it was Jesus. Meanwhile, Adam was that intended pattern son. Adam was supposed to become God's begotten son. The first begotten. And then through Adam, by intercourse, he will bring forth sons in his likeness. Are we seeing that? But we know the story of how man fell, how he disobeyed God and transgressed God, laws of God, and man became an aberration of that which God intended for man to be. Now, on that note and on this account, God had to look for a way to bring his purpose to pass. And that is why you find scriptures like saying that the lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. So that God's purpose cannot fail. Are we seeing it? It can only be delayed but can never fail because he is God. And it was in Christ that every prophecy and every intention of God and the will and the counsel of God is fulfilled. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Amen. And then, um, in Eden, you see, participating and eating literally of the tree or of the fruit of the tree of life. The first eating was supposed to upgrade the man. Are we getting it? The Bible says, and God formed man, Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, out of the dust of the earth. And what did God do? He breathed into the nostrils of what he molded, what was lifeless. And all of a sudden, clay came alive. And that clay became a human being. Praise the Lord. Now, the Bible was careful to tell us that, and he became a living soul. You see, but it was not a living soul that God said, let us make. He didn't say, let us make man a living soul. Are you seeing it now? He said, let us make man in our own image and after our likeness, and then let this man have dominion. So if the man that God formed out of the dust of the earth and breathed into the nostrils of that man and the man became a living soul uh, you see that man has not arrived at God's intention the intention was that man would become what? made in the image in God's own image and after his likeness so it's not just a making of man it's not a production of man it's not bringing man into existence that was the uh, um, 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 purpose the blueprint of God was not just to bring man not just any man. The man that God intended to bring on the face of the earth was specific. It was a man in an order. A man in a pattern. A man that was 
conformed, a man that was shaped into the image and the likeness of God. Are we seeing that? So if you understand the tree of life in Eden, what was intended was that when man will first partake of the tree of life, in that fruit of the tree of life is eternal life. In the tree of life is the divine life of God, Zoe. Now, when man partake of that tree, the first eating was supposed to upgrade man. Do you get it? Was supposed to make man's spirit that was dormant at that time to come alive. Because when man eats of the tree of life, the life of God, which is spirit, are you seeing it? Because God is spirit, will go into the aspect of man that is compliant with the, the entire characteristics of the spirit of God, which is man's spirit. Do you understand? God's spirit cannot interact freely and genuinely with the soul of man, nor with the body of man, because they are not of the same component and of the same element. So God had to, uh, God's intention was that when man eats of the tree of life, and since God is spirit, God will, as life of God and as his spirit, tabernacle where? In the spirit of man. Now, on the account of this tabernacling, there will be a mingling of two spirits. Hallelujah. The spirit of man, which is his natural human spirit, and then the spirit of God, which is God's uncreated divine life. So man's human spirit that was created and God's own created spirit will mingle together to become one. That is not just an amalgamation, it is a union. Praise the Lord. Two shall become one. And it's on the account of such a union that man will become a new creature. So the account of this union that man will be upgraded from a living soul to a living spirit. Are you seeing it now? However, don't forget that the source of life was not in the fruit that man ate. The source of life is in the tree of life. Are you seeing it? Was there life in the fruit? Oh yes, but the source of it was not in the fruit. The fruit of the life was in the tree of life. So it simply means that if man begins to interface, interact, fellowship, and commune with the tree of life, man will be filled, are you seeing it? With this life to the extent that his constituent spirit soul and body will be saturated with the spirit of god hallelujah i hope you know that the spirit of god did not enter into man's soul it did not enter into man's body it entered into man's spirit is that not so or was supposed to in eden to go into man's spirit so you see the continual fellowship with the tree of life and partaking of the tree of life on a daily basis we feel man's spirit Man's spirit will be so full of the spirit of God that the spirit of God will not have enough room to contain. Are you seeing it? So there will be like an overflow and, and a spread of this life into where? Into man's soul. Because that is the next part of being that is closest to the spirit is man's soul. The inner man or the innermost man is man's spirit and then the inner man is what? the soul and then the outer man is the body is that not so so when there's a spilling of this fullness in the spirit where will it naturally first go to to the soul hallelujah and then it begins to affect the soul to the extent that the mind of the man which is the leading part of the soul is renewed and then the emotion is balanced and the will is surrendered and such a being is so full of god that the body has no alternative than to carry out the bidding of the Spirit of God. And then this same infilling of the Spirit and the fullness of the Spirit will extend and overflow through his soul into his body. That is what Paul was referring to in Romans chapter 8 and verse 11 when he says that if the same Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead dwelleth where? 
in you, he said, that same self same spirit shall do what? Quicken your mortal body. It was not talking about healing primarily. Originally, he was talking about a saturation of the spirit of resurrection. The spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, the Holy Ghost. That there is a quickening that it brings to your mortal body. Because you see, sin dwells in your flesh. And when you got born again, sin was not taken away from your flesh. The effects of it. The propensity of it. The law of sin and death still exists in that flesh. Are you getting it now? But you see, when this spirit of God begins to quicken your flesh, you now live as if that spirit, I mean that uh, sin is no longer in your flesh. On the account of what is saturation of the spirit of God that have overwhelmed both your spirit, your soul, and your body. In fact, that is what the Bible refers to as sanctification. Sanctification is what? The, the saturation of God's spirit over a being or a thing. Do you get it? When God's spirit overwhelms this pulpit, you see that this is sanctified. Are we getting it? And that is why there's a sanctification that is positional on the account of regeneration. And then there's also what? A dispositional sanctification that takes place on the account of the transforming work of the spirit, which is progressive and not instantaneous. That's why salvation is in three stages. And then the aspects of salvation are two aspects. You have the positional aspect, you have the dispositional aspect. You have the judicial aspect, you have the, 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 the experiential aspect, you have the legal aspect, you have the organic aspect, you have the objective aspect, you have the subjective aspect of salvation. Two aspects. Are you seeing it? So what Christ had finished on the cross of Calvary is judicial, is legal, is objective, is positional. But for those things that had been finished, for those things that have become your right in Christ, to become a reality in your life, it needs to become a living reality, which makes it organic, <coughs> subjective, dispositional, and experiential. If you are still here, say hallelujah. hallelujah. I said, if you are still here, can I hear you shout hallelujah? Hallelujah. So you must understand that man eating of the tree of life in Eden does not automatically translate. Can you put these fans on for me? Does not automatically translate into a man that God intended. But man eating of the tree of life and continually eating, participating in the tree of life on a daily basis will conform the man to the image of God. Are you seeing it? But instead of Adam to approximate to this God intention, the Bible said he fell. Is that not? He fell from that glory. He fell from that estimation. He fell from that uh, um, 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 expectation of heaven. So Jesus had to come. We've dealt with that extensively here, so I don't need to go that route this morning. But obviously and basically, Jesus had to come as the seed of the woman, not a seed of Adam. Praise the Lord. In other words, he came as the seed of God. He was conceived of a virgin, and no woman has a seed. But it was the word of God, which is actually the seed of God, that brought about his conception in the womb of a virgin. And that is how he was born. He was born unto one end only, to suffer, to die, to be buried, and then to resurrect, so that he can become the very life of God. The word that became flesh in John chapter 1 verse 14 became also a quickening spirit. If you are still here, say hallelujah. hallelujah. The word that became flesh also became what? A quickening spirit. When he was on earth in the flesh, he couldn't say that he was a quickening spirit. The best he said about a quickening spirit was say that the words that I speak unto you, they are what? 
spirit and they are life so if you hear the words i speak to you it can quicken something are you seeing it but when he died was buried and then he resurrected from the dead he was no longer the word become flesh but he became the word that became flesh that had now become spirit and not just a spirit but what a quickening spirit so from the onset jesus began to speak in john chapter 14 and verse number six he said i am the way i am the truth and i am the life and he said no one somebody say no one See, and no one can come to the Father except by me. You cannot arrive at touching life outside Jesus. Praise the Lord. So that was God's intention originally. That man will be made in the image and the very likeness of God. Hallelujah. Satan tried to truncate that order. But because God is still God, his order, his plan, his agenda, his purposes can never be truncated. So even before Satan fell, God had already had his joker. Are we getting it? And the joker was in Jesus Christ. Jesus became the full image of God. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1 tells us that clearly and verse 2. Do we need to read it? Okay, let's look at it. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1 and 2. You see, oh my God. Thank you, Holy Spirit of God. Hallelujah. Is a God who at what? At sundry times and in diverse manners. Spake in the time past unto the fathers by who? By the prophets, had in these last days spoken unto us by who? His son, whom he had appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Who being what? The brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged out sin sat down on his right hand of the majesty now can we hallelujah can we have some of the modern versions quickly anybody verse 3 because okay let's read 1 to 3 still Anybody quickly, let's save time. Tell us your version and read for us. All right, I read the Good News Bible. It says, Going through a long line of prophets, God has been addressing our ancestors in different ways for centuries. Recently, He spoke to us directly through His Son. By his son, God created the world in the beginning and it will all belong to the son at the end. This son perfectly mirrors God. Did you hear that? What does he do? He perfectly mirrors God and is stamped with God's nature. He holds everything together by what he says. Powerful words. Amen. Another version. Um, the New Living Translation. Hallelujah. New Living Translation. Quickly. 
Okay, you have it. All right. Long ago, God spoke many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. And now in these final days, and he has spoken to us through his son. God promised everything to the son as an inheritance. And through the son, he created the universe. Verse 3. Now, did you hear that? The son radiates God's own glory and what? And expresses the very character of God. He sustains everything by the mighty power of his command. He has cleansed us from our sins. He has cleansed us. No, that is verse, just verse 3. Praise the Lord. Now, the Good News Bible, you see, in the past, God spoke to our ancestors by ancestors many times and in many ways through the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us through his son. He is the one through whom God created the universe. The one whom God has chosen to possess all things at the end. He reflects the brightness of God's glory and, in, and is the exact likeness of God's own being sustaining the universe with, the, with his powerful words. So it's one and two. Are we here? Are we here? Praise the Lord. Now, so you discover that for God to be expressed, for God to be seen in his image and likeness, Christ became that picture. Hallelujah. How God would have operated as a man if he was on earth. And that's what God said, let us make man to be. Praise God. Man to be his representative on earth, man to live in his character and in his nature, man to have his power and dominion. And the only man who exhibited that attribute and that fullness of characteristics was Jesus. So if we say that the purpose of God in making man was not fulfilled in Adam or the first Adam, but was fulfilled in the last or the second Adam. Who was that Adam? Jesus. Are you seeing it? So it was Jesus who became the very fulfillment of the plan and the purpose of God. But you see, God did not intend for only Adam to be made in his image. He didn't say, let us make Adam in our own image and after our likeness and then let this Adam have dominion. He said, let us make man. So it means that Adam was just supposed to be a pattern. It's supposed to be a prototype for a mass production. Have we seen it? But because Adam did not become that, but the one who became that was Jesus. Romans chapter 8 and verse 29 now tells us. Are we getting it? That them that he foreknew, he also predestinated that they may be conformed to the image of his firstborn son, who was before this time the only begotten son. But because he is now resurrected, he lost the title of the only begotten and was upgraded to the first begotten because the intention was that God will also have many sons like that. Are we still here? Praise the Lord. He said that he would become the firstborn amongst many brethren. That is the intention of God. And that is what the Bible calls glorification. were called unto glory. Praise the Lord. Having said all that, it becomes easy to not deal with the issue of what? The bride of Christ and the image of Christ. Or dealing with the image of Christ 
you must know that you are first to what? The bride of Christ. The vision the Lord showed me some days ago was that in this vision there was a lamb. You know a lamb? Small lamb. But this lamb was without a head. It was headless. And the lamb was bringing forth children. I don't know whether you understand the picture I just painted. A lamb, it was headless. But this lamb was bringing forth children. But instead of bringing forth children through the normal way that birth occurs through animals, it was the, the, the children were coming forth through his neck. You get it? You know, just like when somebody, I don't know, have you ever, if you have ever eaten, well, it's just like when a man passes excreta. I don't know how, that's the best way I can describe this now. You know, when you drop, you know, and you drop, so they just kept coming in, in batches like that. You would just drop one, then after you drop another one, then you now drop another one, they will just come, and then the moment the thing comes on the ground, it tries to become a lamp, but it's not a lamp. You get it? It's jellyish, it's weak, it cannot, you cannot describe what it is. And then I was looking at this image and I was asking the Lord what it is. And the Lord said, can't I see that it is a lamp? But because the lamp is disconnected from its head, it cannot grow into a sheep. And instead of becoming a sheep, which is God's intention, it remains in that state, but it wants to give birth. And then a scripture popped up. Hebrews chapter 5. Verse number 11. Hallelujah. I did a write-up about this some years back. And I just did a repost of it not too long ago. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse number 11. He said, of whom we have what? Many things to say. Of whom? Who is whom? Come on, talk to me. Who is the whom here? Of Jesus Christ. Of Christ, of whom we have many things to say. The Christ who was, though a son. What happened? Learned obedience by the things that he suffered. Hallelujah. And then by that process... He was made the high priest of our salvation. Not just our salvation, our eternal salvation to those who obey him. Are you seeing it? So Paul said, of this Christ, we have many things to say. But there was an irony, a quagmire that troubled uh, 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 Paul in his day. Hallelujah. What was it? He said, and has to be uttered, he said, we, uh, we, uh, of whom we have many things to say, and, and hard to be uttered, seeing that we are dull of hearing seeing that we are lacking understanding there's so much to teach you but you are not opening up to grow you are not opening up to receive these things there's only one meal you still want to be taking all the time and the meal is milk and only lambs take milk 
Are you seeing it? Lambs don't eat grass. They don't eat solid food. They don't eat fodder. It's only milk because they are lambs. They can't grow. Taking only milk, there's a point that they, they, even humans, when you begin to breastfeed your child, the time comes you begin to mix the milk with something else. And then the time comes you want to stop the child entirely from milk. As an adult, don't you take milk? But you see that you don't take milk for survival. You take milk for nourishment. You take milk to mix with other things. You don't just take milk and say, this is my meal, morning, afternoon, evening. But a child can do that. Are we seeing it now? He said, having seen that word, you are dull of hearing. Now, verse 12, quickly. <coughs> Praise God. For when, what? For the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which is the first principles of the oracles of God, and have become such that have need of milk and not strong meat. Did you see that? You see, that was the, the, the quagmire in the day of Paul. But the irony in our own day, you see, Paul had babies who liked to remain babies. And it was not a good case. But we have a worse case. And the case is that we have babies who don't want to admit that they are babies. I wish somebody heard what I just said. So they disconnect from the head. Who is supposed to help them grow. And then they come out with their own new revelations. And they want to churn out disciples in that order. So what they bring out. Does not conform. To God's original plan. Which is to be conformed to the image of Christ. When babies begin to bet children. When babies become lawless, when babies disconnect from source, and then they try to give birth, what they will give birth to certainly will not resemble the order of procreation that God put in place. Now, do we understand that? I became troubled so much, and it's in the course of being troubled and meditating that the Lord now gave me this theme to speak about. The bride of Christ and the image of Christ. Praise the Lord. Amen. So number one, the first thing we saw, even in the scripture we read, was what? The word lamb. The Bible said, after they had finished dining, the Lord spoke to Peter. Is that not? He said, lovest thou me more than this? More than your belly? More than your pleasure? More than your comfort? More than your life? More than the things of this world? He said, Lord, thou knowest that I love you. Now, did the Lord argue with him? Was the love of Peter at this point denied? You see, Peter loved the Lord, but the quality or the level of love, the measure of love was the issue. Just like everyone who comes into Christ, we all love Jesus, but the degree to which we love him is what matters. Praise the Lord. So to what degree do we love Jesus? So what was the instruction? Feed my lamb. Let me say this quickly. I'd like you to understand that a shepherd does not produce sheep. I wish somebody heard me. You have to be a sheep to produce a sheep. You understand what I just said? A 
A headless lamb is a dead lamb, even though living. And as long as the lamb is headless, it cannot become a sheep. And if it does not become a sheep, it is not grown and matured enough to reproduce. So you cannot reproduce in immaturity. What you will produce will not resemble the intention of the purpose for reproduction. Do we understand what I just said? Then the Lord now asked Peter the second time, Peter, lovest thou me more than this? And he said, Lord, thou knowest that I, Peter, love you. What did he now say? Feed my sheep. Did you see that? Then for the third time, he asked Peter again, Peter, lovest thou me more than these? Pleasure of satisfaction of your hunger? Pleasure of the satisfaction of your desires? Of the fulfillment of your loss? Of bringing to pass your will do you love me more than the things you want to accomplish more than your ambition do you truly love me beyond your feelings do you love me beyond your will do you really love me beyond all that you know beyond your comfort beyond the things that you stand to gain outside me and that's what the Bible says, that what shall it profit a man? If he gains what? The whole world. Let's assume the whole world is possible to be willed to you, to be given to you. If you gain it at the expense of your soul, what shall it profit you? That's what the Lord was saying to Peter. Lovest thou me more than this? Are we still here? And then the Bible says, Peter got annoyed. I wish somebody heard that. Peter was offended. <coughs> not because his love was questioned. But because he was not asked just only the first time. And the second time. But he was asked again what? The third time. Hallelujah. Put it on the board. Hallelujah. I'm seeing Pastor Rema Oguche. Sorry, I'm not Rema Oguche. I love him so dearly. I, I, I'm in love with the young man, but I am not Rema Oguche. Thank you. Ela Dejo is my own name. And the two of us cannot be, I, I don't desire to be him, and I don't expect him to desire to be me. Somebody say, I am me. I am nobody else. And nobody else. It's me. I desire not to be like any other person. I desire to just be me. But if any other person desire to be me, it's the person's decision. <laughs> but for me, <laughs> I just want to be me. Praise God. He said unto him again, the third time. We are looking at the third time now here. Praise the Lord. He said unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Now, did you see that they didn't ask him more than this? Can you go back to the former verse? Second time. Or let's start from the first time. Hallelujah. Amen. So when they had dined, Jesus, what? Say it to Simon Peter. Can you reduce this thing into the space, please? Son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than this? Can you jump to the next one now? The next verse. Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Have you seen it? 
The first question was addressing what led to their backsliding. Are we getting it? Forget your comfort. There's something I'm doing on the earth. I want to win converts. In fact, the essence of calling them, you remember, he said, follow me and I will do what? And I will make you fishers of men. For every fish or every man you fish, he becomes a lamb. Do you know to that point? The Bible says, as babes desire what? The sincere milk of their mother, so also as new babies in the Lord as lamb. What do you do? You desire the sincere milk of the word of God. So milk is given to lambs. I'm going somewhere. Praise God. They said, do you love me? He said, you know that I love you. He said, feed my sheep. So when you make them lambs, don't leave them lawless. Hallelujah. The essence of saving them, the essence of bringing them into the faith is to help them to see the finished work of Jesus. Are we getting me now? To know they are right in Christ Jesus. That is faith. Are you getting me? When you teach them faith, and then they begin to know they are right upon the finished work of Jesus Christ. Don't leave them there. Are you getting me? That is the greatest problem the body of Christ is having today. Men who have been brought into their rights, who now are men of faith, but they think that that is all that Christianity is. I, 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 no offense intended, no attack intended, but can I tell you this? Most of the average thing today called Pentecostalism and charismatic movement in the world today is this kind of Christianity. Do you understand? That's what we call the new creation reality. They teach you that your faith is strong to walk in the fullness of the finished work of Jesus. But it doesn't end there. Let me look at your neighbor and say it doesn't end there. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yes, the next verse. The third time, he said to him again, unto him the third time, Simon, son of what? Jonas, lovest thou me? You have asked me whether I love you more than these things. I've said yes. You have asked me whether I love you. I've said yes. You say, feed my sheep. So why are you asking me for the third time? What, what, what's the need for the third time? But there was something that Jesus wanted to bring Peter into. Now, if you notice and you observe uh, um, 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 John's writing, particularly in the episodes, there were three categories of people that John was addressing. The first category of people were who? Children. Children. Thank you, sir. Who was he addressing? Children. And then the second group of people were who? Young men. And then who are the third category of people? Fathers. Anytime he speaks to young uh, to, 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 to children. He talks to them about what? Sin. And what Christ has made available, the finished work. Anytime he talks to the young men, he talks to them about what? Their strength, exploit, accomplishment. But anytime he talks to the father, he talks about the fathers, he talks about what? Experience, fellowship, knowing the Lord. So you cannot remain a baby forever. God's intention is to bring you to a point that you know what the Lord can do if he's here now. What the Lord will do. When you hear people grumbling and murmuring when they go through trials, it's allowed, it's okay. But when you begin to go through trials as a father and you are complaining like a babe, there is something wrong. Are we getting it now? Say, oh Lord, why me? Why you? But Paul said, now we know 
Children don't know. Are you getting it? No matter how painful, no matter how that thing is, now we do what? We know. That how many things? All things. All things. <coughs> is it only the good things? No, is it only bad, 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 bad things? No, See that all things work together for good. Not to everybody, but to the mature, to them that do what? That love God. To them that are the call according to his purpose. That is why the Bible, Paul exalted in the book of Thessalonians, he said, give thanks. In how many things? In all things. Why? Because all things are working together for my good. I love God. Is it a loss? Thank God. Is it again? Thank God. Paul said, for me to live is Christ. But to die is gain. You see, so whether I'm alive or I'm dying, there's no cause for regret. That's how a mature believer looks through life. You know, see that your life does not consist actually on the abundance of what? The things that you possess. There's nothing wrong for you to possess things on earth, but your life does not consist on it. No matter how much you earn, no matter how much you own, no matter how much you possess, if you lose all in one day, will you deny God? That was the test that came to Jonah, uh, uh, to Job. Praise God. There was only one confidence he had every night. After all the pummeling, after all the torture, after all the panel beating he goes through, when he crawls towards his window in the night and he looks through the sky and he sees the three northern stars still standing, he knows that God had not been overthrown. When he looks at the three northern stars still standing, he knows that his Redeemer lived. See, I know that my Redeemer So even when he was told to deny God, he couldn't deny God. Even when the options came to look for the easy way out, he couldn't. We are coming and approaching a day that if, we, if this is not our goal, are we getting me to, to understand that we are the bride of Christ and there is only one journey on earth to be what? Conformed to the image of Christ. If our focus is diverted to things, if our focus is diverted to success, if are we getting it now? To breakthroughs and all that. So if we deviate from this major uh, um, um, purpose of heaven, we'll be beguiled by the enemy. So the Lord calls back his church to this reality. Are we still here? So it's sheep that gives birth to sheep. Right? Or sheep give birth to lambs and not to goats. And neither do shepherds do. Shepherds don't give birth. And sheep don't give birth to goats. But how come sheep are now giving birth to goats? Sheep never gives birth to goats. But when there is a lamb without head, Are you getting me? It's the goat who does what he wants to do. The lamb, the sheep, does what the shepherd wants it to do. So on one hand, we are called to be sheep that will give birth to lambs. On the other hand, we are called to be shepherds that will feed the lamb, that the lamb will become what? The sheep. See, Peter was grieved because the Lord, or because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me. And he said unto him, Lord, what did he say? <coughs> he didn't say thou knowest, now he said thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Thank God you agree that I know all things, not only that you love me. Now, if you agree that he knows all things, then all things work together for 
Does he love you? So what does all things accrue unto? Working to your good. It is on the account of that he now brought him to that revelation. Now that you agree that I don't only know that you love me, but you know that I know all things. I'm going to bring you into situations that you have not entered into before. I'm going to take you beyond the shallow waters. And I'm going to be stepping your feet into what? Into the deep waters where people drown. But the difference between you and where others that drown is that when you go through these waters, I will be with you. Are you seeing it? When you go through the fires, the fires will not burn you, the flames will not scorch you, the waters will not drown you. The only reason is that the difference between people that fire burn and the flames afflict and the waters drown is that they didn't go with me. But as you are going into these situations, who is going in with you? I wish somebody is hearing me this morning. I don't know who I'm talking to. The days that are coming ahead, are you listening to me? Are not going to be funny days. But the Lord is saying to you that you are going to survive those days for just one reason. Him, the Lord, is going with you. I don't know who that word is for. But the Lord will go with us. Into the seasons that are ahead of us. Praise the Lord. I said praise the Lord. And then what did he now tell him? He said, follow me. That was the end of that instruction. Follow me. Follow me. It's a call to followership. In other words, what Jesus was actually saying to him in essence concerning feeding the lamb, Concerning feeding the sheep is what? Follow worship. If you follow me, you qualify to feed my lamb. I wish somebody had that. If you follow me, you qualify to feed my sheep. Paul says, Follow me as what? I follow Christ. So it means that I lost the authority to command your followership the moment I stopped following Christ. I, I, I don't know whether you understand. My, your followership to me is perpetual or perpetually related to my continual followership of Christ. The day I stop following Christ is the day you should stop following me. If you follow me, when I stop following Christ, you follow me at your own detriment. Are you getting me now? You are no longer following Christ. You are only following Christ when you follow me if I'm still following Christ. You get it? If you continue following me when I stop following Christ, it's no longer Christ you are following, it's me you are following. And what your life will become will not resemble what God intended which is the image of Christ. What is your life becoming? What are you becoming? You see, I've not been able to touch the issue of bride yet. But the question this morning is, who are you truly really what? Following. Who is the Peter of your life? Who is Peter following? Are you a lamb or are you a sheep or are you a lamb without head which one have you become somebody